Support the Amigos podcast and keep the Amiga goodness flowing for just a dollar a month. Visit our page at patreon.com slash Amigos podcast. Amiga, the first personal computer that gives you a creative edge. Amigos, the podcast about everything Amiga. Amigos is a proud member of the Throwback Network, your home for quality retro podcasts. And now, here are your hosts, Aaron Dowdy and John Bodokar Schaller. Hi, and welcome to Amigos. I'm John. And I'm Aaron. And today we're going to talk about TV sports basketball. But before we do, uh, Aaron, we've got a, a new bit of feedback. Uh, this came okay. from uh, our blog. Uh, if you want to leave a comment on our blog, it's amigospodcast.com. Uh, Paul Kitching, uh, who is one of our UK listeners, he wrote in uh, to talk about 21st century entertainment. Okay, excellent. So, so uh, he said that they were previously a company called Houston Consultants who did these games. And you tell me if you've heard of any of these. Okay, uh, I, I have heard of Houston Consultants. I have heard of them, I think. Okay, Paradroid. I've heard of that. Uh, Iridium. Yes, Iridium is a, a shooter, uh, an excellent shooter, okay. as I recall, yeah. Uh, Cybernoid? Mm, I don't remember that one. Okay, and he said that uh, there is uh, Andrew Houston, who I guess is the Houston behind the name, uh, is uh, releasing a book about it all soon, so we'll keep an eye out on that. You know, that explains a lot, because in the, in the uh, interview I read with the guy from 21st Century Entertainment, he acted like they'd been around, mm-hmm. and I was, that's why I was like baffled, because you look at what they were, and they hadn't done anything you know prior to the game he was talking about and that's why i was like what's going on here well that explains it yeah you know iridium as i recall was a pretty popular game oh cool um and he also said surprising you haven't heard of the c16 (laughs) he said it (laughs) wasn't it wasn't very popular here in the uk but everyone had heard of it uh i guess maybe infamously um and he he uh so strangely came out after the c64 uh and um and he remembered what they he he said that uh, he remembers uh, thinking you know what were they thinking and he said I was about thirteen and I could easily see what a bad idea it was to bring out a worse <laughs> machine than what everybody already had. It's not good when you're thirteen and you're outsmarting the big wigs. Right. I could see where you know he was angling for a niche market. Mm-hmm. You know, but uh, I don't think they realized how quickly the C sixty four price would fall. Maybe no, because the price fell so quick. You know, and, and that, I think maybe they thought that more people were using C sixty fours for business type applications, word processing, and stuff like that. Nope, nope. <laughs> <laughs> incorrect, sir. Yeah. So uh, thanks, Paul, for that feedback. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Would you like to comment on this week's episode? Did John and Aaron finally make their first mistake? Leave us a comment at our blog at amigospodcast dot com. All right, our game this week is TV Sports Basketball. Uh, TV Sports Basketball was released in 1990. It was developed by CinemaWare and published by Mirrorsoft for the Amiga, DOS, Commodore, and TurboGrafx-16. Uh, it's part of the TV Sports series that included TV Sports Baseball, as well as other games based on hockey, American football, and boxing. Um, a little bit about CinemaWare. They were founded in 1985 by Bob and Phyllis Jacob. Um, Cinemaware's first title, here's a little trivia for you, Aaron. Do you do you know their first title? I believe it was Defender of the Crown. You got it, Defender of the Crown. Um, and so, But they eventually expanded into sports games with its TV sports line. Uh, all, of those, uh, all of those games featured elements of sports telecasts, such as studio announcers, um, the TV sports line covered basketball, ice hockey, and football. Um, some of the titles were only known by TV sports by the TV sports name in Europe, uh, TV sports boxing and TV sports baseball, which were released in the United States by Data East as ABC Worldwide of Sports Boxing and Bo Jackson Baseball, respectively. So that, that's crazy because I, I never remember either of those. I always had the European version. Really? Yes. Yeah, I don't. I, <laughs> It, it makes sense, though, they, if they could capitalize on, you know, a name like ABC Worldwide of Sports, that's a, a lot better than, you know, TV Sports Boxing. That's a, that's a heck of a license, too, yeah. to, to sign up. I'm yeah. very impressed. And, and, of course, Bo Jackson was, a, if you'll recall, Huge. was a big star back Huge. in those days. And a heck of a ball player, baseball player and football, but yeah. really a good baseball player. Um, CinemaWare uh, went bankrupt in 1991. 
Yeah, that's sad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, they uh, it says, uh, coupled with fa- falling sales of their other titles in the midst of an economic downturn, uh, the company suffered. Uh, they suffered also from software piracy, along with many other Amiga developers. <clears throat> uh, they threatened to stop publishing Amiga games at several points because of the ease by which the uh, the games could be copied. Um, many of the games, including one of your favorites, Wings, were cracked and spread amongst gamers even before their release. Uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, I love Cinemaware too, so I can't help but but feel personally responsible for their demise because I was one of the many young jerks that, of course, to be fair, after I got into the Amiga pretty much after they were gone. But, uh, yeah, it's that's sad. Uh, I did read an, inter- I read an interview with a fellow from somewhere. He said he didn't think piracy alone is what downed them. I think uh, part of the problem was, and I hate to say this on an Amiga podcast, but they, uh, they put all their eggs in the Amiga basket, so to speak, in a lot of ways. And... When, and as Amiga fell off in the states, so did their business. So, and you know that's straight from the horse's mouth. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I'm sure it's <laughs> it's never just one factor, and um, it's a shame because you know, like you said, you've got to admire a company like CinemaWare who wants to put their titles on the most advanced platform for the time. Sure. They just happened to choose the one that was also the, the failed platform. Well, unfortunately, they, as we all know, management. They yeah. had a great platform, but the horrible management. Right, right. Um, so, uh, do you have anything else about CinemaWare that's worth doing? <clears throat> well, they are sort of still around. You know, you know they came back, uh, if you'll recall... Uh, I think the uh, r- the other rights and the games were purchased. I want to say in '95 ish, maybe a little later, and they had a, I guess, a sequel or a reboot of Defender of the Crown. It was out on the, uh, I'm pretty sure it was on the PC, and I think it was on the consoles too. Uh, I think it was called Robin Hood: Defender of the Crown. Something like that. You, does that ring a bell to you? No, I have yeah. no recollection of yeah, that. Yeah, I was out. I don't remember liking it that much. Um, they said they had more titles in the works, and uh, I don't think they ever shipped anything else. Um, I, I'm hoping that uh, since the Wings remastered has done, I think pretty well, that uh, they will that they will you know try to remaster other cl- you know, Cinemaware classics. I mean, Cinemaware they're one of my all time favorite uh, companies. And when you open one of their boxes, they had all kinds of cool stuff in there. They called their discs reels. I always thought that was cool. Insert reel two, insert reel one. They had some of my favorite games on the Amiga, uh, and they uh, they deserved a better fate. You know, it's it's a shame they really didn't get to make anything for the consoles, so to speak. I mean, there was a few things. I think Wings got uh, console ports, and uh, Defender of the Crown. And Defender of the Crown got ports. But too. Uh, you know, a lot of their best titles never got. No one ever saw them because mm-hmm. they were only on the Amiga. I didn't know there was a C sixty four version of. Uh, TV sports basketball until I you know started researching this so I've never seen it so that might be interesting to see yeah um so TV sports basketball let's talk about what makes this game uh unique or you know what are the features of the game um players can either play against the computer or with another person so uh and when they play against another person you can go in versus mode or you can play cooperatively on the same team uh, that was a feature not found in a lot of basketball games at this time. The, the feature that blew my mind, and I swear to you, I'd never, of course, I didn't have the manual. Uh, this game supported four players. Absolutely. With the uh, parallel port joystick. I had no idea. And I'll be exploring that option in the future because that would be outstanding. Yeah. Uh, I like the fact they had a role playing mode where you could just pick one player on the team and play that without having to switch around. Mm hmm. Uh, it had uh, it was so far ahead of everything I'd ever seen basketball was. I don't know about you. Are you a basketball fan? Uh, I'm not a basketball fan, but I have played quite a few basketball games. Yeah. I uh, <laughs> When I started my job in Lexington, Kentucky, for those of you that know anything about Lexington, Kentucky, USA, it's the home of the uh, UK Wildcats, which is the biggest college basketball team in the country. When I started my job there, they said, as a guy came to escort me to my workplace, he said, well, you're in Kentucky now. You know, do you like horse racing? I was like, no. He said, do you like bourbon? I was like, no. He goes, do you like basketball? I was like, no. He goes, you're in a lot of trouble, boy. <laughs> I was like, oh, boy. And the only basketball knowledge I had obtained was from playing TV sports basketball <laughs> before I moved down there. But now, 
You like bourbon. I do like bourbon. You like... Do you like horse racing? And, uh, <laughs> well, I, maybe I do watch it now because you have no choice when you live there. And then, but I still don't like basketball. But I do like playing TV sports basketball. Uh, this title was introduced to me well before I had an Amiga. My friend Rich uh, had an Amiga. He picked this up, and him and another friend Hose decided to start a league. And they went through. And one of the great features about TV sports basketball is you can edit the rosters and the teams. And so they went through and they edited all the teams. They put all the current NBA stars in the game, and then they they uh, ranked them. You know, there's a there's a system to set up you know their abilities, uh, and it was it was really neat. There's only one team in the league you can't edit, which is the Cinemaware team, well, ironically, and uh, their team is is awesome. But uh, we used to have a lot of fun with that, and still on my original discs at the house, they're all. They're all still have. I got a copy of my buddy, so it's got all the same, you know, edited teams. And my buddy, of course, he had an alternative ego called Ricky Quest. So he put himself in the game with top scores. He plays for the Lakers, and he he every time he comes onto the screen, he just jumps a three pointer from half court. It's irritating (laughs) as hell. (laughs) But yeah, we spent a lot of time playing this back in the day. You know, that the the perspective on the game is pretty unique i mean the half court perspective isn't necessarily unique there are other games that did it jordan versus bird uh is the one that immediately comes to mind yeah. but the way that they have that cut scene that you know shows the players running from one side of the court to the other i thought was interesting and i wondered if they did that for you know cinematic purposes or i wonder if that was kind of a trick to get around some loading i don't think it was a loading issue i will say you know i've, I've pondered this quite a bit I love their perspective. That's what made the game. They really, you. That's one of the few games. That it, still to this day, I can't play a game. You know, with the, the abilities I had in TV sports, with, because of the the perspective gives you a good view of all your the people you can pass to, the shots you can take. The half court perspective, where they just run across the screen. Excuse me. Is uh, I, nothing really happening happens at that part of the court no. unless there's a full court press on or something like that. Uh, uh, or someone takes a crazy shot. So you could sort of get away with eliminating it, and, and it actually works. Uh, it probably made the game easier to program. I guess, they, you know, if they didn't have that, what would they have? I mean, even if they gave you the ability to control your guys there, it really probably wouldn't make too much of a difference. So I think they probably made the right choice. Yeah. And um, one thing that's cool, too, is that you actually get the option – when you uh, when you when you play, you can either control the same player throughout the entire course of the match, or the one currently in possession of the ball. Yeah, the which I like. The, it's that's the role playing feature where you can just have one guy. Uh, I never did that because I'm a control freak, <laughs> but <laughs> it is fun to do it. It's you know if, if you could get four play, people playing this at once and control a team, now that would be something sweet. It's still neat. I mean, you can go through a whole season playing one guy, if yeah. you to, which would be cool if you wanted to really pad your stats or whatever. I find the computer of um, adequate uh, difficulty. The the uh, it's not a it's not a pushover, Mm-mm. and I've played it for the game for years and years, and I lose all the time. Yeah, uh, and especially some of the better teams, they they can steamroll you, especially if you make bad shots. And that's the good thing about it; they it rewards. It rewards your vision of, of watching your players. Now, there's an option on there on the screen. Uh, there's a uh, uh, there a, the the player's le- the number will flash over his head, and and it'll be green, or you know it'll flash different colors, and that's how you know how open he is when you pass. We always turn that off, uh, which is cool that the option's there to do it, um, because. I don't know. I don't know why we did it. I just that's every time we ever played it. That's how they started doing it. So I've done it ever since. But it's nice to have the option there to see, you know, who you're going to be throwing to, if you, and, and what and how open they are. I think it's not cheap. You know, it's not a cheap game. With it's not like NBA Jam, for example, where you can jump to a lead and the computer's always going to catch up. Yeah, you know? there's not a lot of rubber banding that goes on. Something else I really dug about it was the uh, ability to take the TV timeouts. It was very realistic. I mean, I thought in terms of what of an actual basketball game, the ability to substitute players and the ability to substitute players out of position which we used to do all the time. We'd have both centers in and <laughs> <laughs> four, four Two huge guys <laughs> lumbering around. You know? um, something else about this game that I, I always think about is it took advantage of extended memory 
in a weird way. And the weird way is you would hear uh, occasional noises or or samples that you would not normally hear if you didn't have the extended memory. Like if you hit an alley oop, if you have the extended memory, you hear alley oop. You know, you'll hear uh, uh, a couple other phrases that will come in. I like the fact the sound on this is awesome. It's got that uh, the the sound of the sneakers on the on the floor. You know, is is cool. I always thought uh, the uh, uh, the ability to edit the rosters can't be understated. That that's a big deal. And I can't think of a game before that, short of one of the micro league sports simulators that would let you do that. Can you? No, no. Uh, you know, not only that, but you could actually, if you had twenty eight friends or you know multiple people play in each team you could actually set up a full season draft where each person is in control of you know one or a couple teams and uh you know play all the games that would be that would be really cool yeah if you'd have enough people to do it yeah now you know the the one downside (laughs) i read is that when you do the full season mode unfortunately you cannot shorten the the time of the periods so you actually have to play four 12-minute periods in real time. <laughs> and that's that's a long game, yeah, you know. Yeah, I always go to five-minute quarters, mm-hmm. you know, due to time constraints of my life. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, that would be a long game. That's the way that's the way Hose and, and Rich were doing it. They were playing full games. And they had pretty realistic scores as well, you know. Mm-hmm. And there were certain teams in the league that were pushovers. I mean, they did a real good job. Something we haven't touched on, by the way, is the opening. I just love it. The music is awesome. The fanfare, da, 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 da. I hear, I can hear it in my head. <laughs> the uh, the way the the camera pans across the court, you can see the guys out there practicing. They see the cheerleaders out there jumping around, and then they cut to the announcer, and he's up there at the desk. And he, I just thought that was so awesome. Oh yeah, I mean that's the uh, that's the cinema where yes. touch. And and the fact that they it would the commercial at the end of the segment would change every time, which was <laughs> always the news were always funny. Mm-hmm. The art was great. I mean, the graphics were just top shelf. I remember yeah. when I first saw it, it was like this is like watching TV. Even when you you know you go in to pick the options and everything, they could have you know really uh, gone generic and just had a you know a cursor or a pointer or something. But they've got that pencil, you know, you can you yeah. use to select things <laughs> on the clipboard. And it's got the big clipboard. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, they really it, it's. It's really nice to see that, and uh, there was—I'm sure there was nothing else available like that. The, you know, my my ranking of uh, of best retro basketball games pretty much begins and ends with Techno NBA Basketball, <laughs> which I have not played. Um, that was a—it was a game for the Super Nintendo, but it was when it was kind of the golden era <laughs> of Techno releasing great sports games. Sure. Um, you know, Tecmo Super Bowl. Oh yeah. Um, and uh, but this, I've got to say, this is a this is a great game. This doesn't play as fast as as Tecmo NBA basketball. I think that's my one complaint is that it is a little bit slow. Yeah, it's a it's a slower game. There's no doubt. It's not a it's not a Twitch game by any stretch of the imagination. But it is. It's very well done, and it, it's very realistic. Did you did you happen to try the other versions? No, I've no. actually tried both versions. Really? <laughs> In fact, I've extensively played the uh, Turbo Graphics. I've got a Turbo Graphics, and I've, of course, I've been emulating it for years. It's good. I mean, it's 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 pretty close uh, to the Amiga version. It plays, I think, a little quicker. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think it's 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 as attractive as an overall package as the Amiga version. Of course, the, there's things you can't do uh, that you can on the Amiga, obviously. But uh, it's not bad. I don't know if it supports four players. Uh, I believe uh, Turbo Graphics had a four. Yeah, there is adapter. a. It's called the Turbo <laughs> Tap, I think. Yeah, yeah. and I, so it would be interesting to to to, uh, to see if it would support four. I don't have a physical copy of it, mm-hmm. unfortunately. I, I'd love to, but it's that's hard to find too for the Turbo Graphics. I've yeah. actually looked around. The PC version, I was stunned that there was one when I first heard about it years ago, when I didn't have an Amiga, and uh, it's okay. You know, it's a lot like the other PC releases of Amiga stuff. Mm-hmm. They did their best, right? You know, but uh, it was okay. But the, you can't you can't beat the Amiga version. I think the Turbo Graphics one thing it does have going forward is multiple buttons, mm. and so you can actually, as I recall, you can switch players with, uh, that you're looking at with one button and sh- or or maybe shoot and pass. The two, as I recall, there are two buttons you use. Right. Well, it, it makes sense that they'd utilize both of the buttons on the controller. For Although that. really, I never had any problem. With one, mm-hmm. I thought it played real well. This is another one I fire up my, I get my Wicko out and and, and go to work. What did you think of the uh, tip off sequence? Oh, I thought it's great. It's that I've got to say that's probably the best 
the best well the best done tip off sequence of any <laughs> basketball game. It's I mean it's, it's functional. It's not it's beautiful. Well it's it's beautiful to look at. It's not very realistic, of course, but just the way that, you know, you've got you and the your opponent are fighting to tip it to your guy or the other guy. I mean, it's better than just having a big mass of players in the middle and everybody's jamming their button and then, you know, something happens. Yeah. I mean, again, it's stuck to their Cinema Wars original vision of of uh, creating a, a TV like experience. You can certainly see why, uh, you know, ABC would license to them. That's a perfect that's a perfect uh people to license a sports game for mm-hmm. it's they could have you know it's funny I, I i don't know if you've played the other tv sports games not to go into them too much but this one is by far and away the best one. is it it's i didn't like boxing and i'm a big boxing fan or i was back then um I, hockey was in eh, the the football was i just didn't like it at all i mean again the presentation was okay but the uh the play selection the way it played it just I didn't didn't do it for me. I mean, this is the cream of the crop mm. of, of of the TV sports game. It's a shame that they didn't take that that wild world of sports license and do something like a summer games, you know, or yeah. uh, you know, a multi event sports you know, game. That would fit Cinema Wars MO too, if you think about it, because a lot of their games are based around mini games, right? You know, so you've got, I mean, even like, like the Defender, Defender of the Crown, of the Crown mm-hmm. or Wings or Rocket Ranger, or, you know, all those games are based on like our Three Stooges, perfect example, mm-hmm. one that's based, that's mini game based. Yeah. So it would have worked. I think they could have probably pulled it off. And Lord knows they had the cin- cinematics down. Uh, the, the crew that worked on their games was outstanding. One thing I did learn from doing a little research, because they did a lot of, apparently I didn't know this, but they did a lot of ports to the C64. <coughs> and they were talking about. The, they liked porting from the Amiga to the C64 because they would take all those images they would create and they would just remove every other pixel. Oh. <laughs> and, then that was, and somehow that would... <laughs> that's how they moved it down. Okay. That's directly from the horse's mouth. Interesting. Right? The, uh, that's how they would port those those images down. The uh, I bet the C64 versions probably look pretty good. I'll have to look at this, what they look like. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to I do some comparison there, too. Well... Um, I will tell you that I lost <laughs> the game that I played. Um, so I have a feeling that uh, when we do play this against each other, you're going to destroy me. I'm going to try. <laughs> I, I, uh, I played probably 20 games in the past two weeks. Wow. And uh, I, this is something that's on my, it's on my computer all the time. I, I mean, at work mm-hmm. <laughs> at home, I've always got it you know, set up. It's a comfort game for me to set down, which is funny because you know, sports games... You know, I like sports. Don't get me wrong, but and if you'd say, "Hey, your comfort game is basketball," but come on, you know it's not karate or something. No, it's basketball. But it, this game, I think the pace is part of what I like because it's like slipping on an old shoe and you and you you walk down. It's not manic. You've got time to survey the the scene and uh, uh, you know choose who you're going to pass to and be a little more. Uh, cerebral about the game mm-hmm. something else we haven't tapped we haven't touched on is the fact that the ability to change uh, defenses you know change uh you know what your positionings yeah yeah and uh again pretty far ahead of the curve i mean like you said i hadn't thought about the comparisons of larry bird and uh dr jago 101 but you know this definitely the uh, the screen setup is the same it's almost like they just modernized that setup added the appropriate amount of players and it it works. I mean, mm-hmm. that's an awesome setup. I mean, as archaic as that game looks, it plays great still. I've played it in the past year, and it's it's a lot of fun, you know. So this one's, you know, multitudes of more fun, but it's still the system works, you know. Now, have you actually played any other basketball games for the Amiga? Yeah. Let me think for a moment. Because I'm trying to think what about basketball games are available uh, for the Amiga. I don't think I'm sure the NBA Jam stuff was not around. No, <laughs> that's a good question, Boat. I honestly have. Can you even think of another basketball game? No, um, I think I take that back. It seems like Magic Johnson might have had a game. Fast Break. That was his game on the consoles. I, I think. I think, or it might have been Lakers versus Celtics. Mm-hmm. It was one of those two. Mm-hmm. It was that would have put that. That would have been that right time period. It's funny because I, I can vaguely remember the screenshot, but I remember my disc because <laughs> I don't know why that's in my head. I can picture the disc in my hand, uh, but I don't. Re- you know, this was the. This yeah, was I'm the sure one. if you ask any, you know, any Amiga fan, you know, name the best basketball game for the Amiga. This would be 
the, the the one that they would pick. Here's a question for you and for the listeners to ponder. Maybe someone out there knows something we don't. You had TV sports boxing. You had TV sports basketball and f- American football, and they had hockey, right? Why no soccer? They were very European-centric. Soccer is the number one sport over there. Did they think they couldn't get their foot in the door with the uh, big soccer titles? I don't know. I'd be interested to know why they wouldn't do a soccer title. It seems like that'd be one of their bigger sellers. Yeah. And um, now Cinemaware, they are they're an American company, right? Uh, you know, I think they are. <laughs> they were founded. I was reading an interview with the guy that founded them. They were founded by a funding raised from Mormon Utah Mormon doctors and dentists. So I'm going to go on the assumption. Okay, that probably American. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I I don't know how comfortable. I can't think of too many American developers that were doing soccer games. Well, you got to consider though that uh, they were selling the majority of their titles in Europe. Yeah. You know, so you'd yeah. think maybe you'd import some on to uh, handle it and they had the perfect structure for a soccer game they could have used the same sort of setup that basketball had sure absolutely you know? uh you know the sensible games have that same top down you know viewpoint um it would be interesting to know why they why they didn't tackle that because uh with the just you know it's amazing to me that they there weren't more companies that that thought hey you know people like watching sports on tv why don't we take some of the things that are great about watching it on tv and combine it with the interactivity seems like a no-brainer but they were really the only company to do stuff like that at this time you know something else they did i mean you're right you're 100 right it makes you wonder why why no one else did it but also on top of the fact that you got the visuals on top of the fact that the gameplay is very realistic the stats were good and could be printed so you could actually print out the stats via the program it could you could print. You could print from the program. You could print out stats. You, you could have stats for the whole year. That's great. I mean, you know, I mean, think I just think about, about when I when I was in college, we used to do uh, you know Tecmo Super Bowl seasons and you know keep track of our stats and everything. And but there was no because it was a console game. There was no medium to do anything like that, and that would have been great. You know. Yeah. I. Uh, I, that's another thing I didn't know about was the ability to print stats. Which that's is awesome. Cool. Something else I read that I thought was amusing. I sort of knew this, but sort of didn't. Um, all the uh, CinemaWare players. And well, if you play the game straight out of the box, you've got made up names for all the for all the players, right? And they're sort of like they're sort of like the NBA counterparts of the time. Like there's a guy called Air Jordash, <laughs> for example. That's one I always think of. And um, there's a couple of, but anyway, they they would base players on employees, mm-hmm. and so a lot of the employee names are in the game, which I thought was cute. It's a good way to do it. Put yourself in the game, give yourself stats, and <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't know if it's like that with football or any of the other ones, but with this one, they actually put themselves in there. And of course, I like the fact that there's a Cinemaware team and the fact that you can't screw with them, right? <laughs> <laughs> so they make, they make good and sure they will be represented. Now, I think there are more people in the league than just the Cinemaware team on the unedited version. Like I said, it's been so long since I played it, the unedited version. I can't remember all the names because mine have all been edited, but uh, but uh, the uh, the Cinemaware team you can't mess with, and they're tough. Like I said, who who do you usually pick when you play? Oh. I don't know. I can't remember. Yeah, I usually play New Jersey, <laughs> <laughs> and they're well, not good. But and there certainly some teams are better than others. Mm-hmm. You know, you can tell. I when wonder this was if made. they uh, if they were looking at the um, the actual NBA landscape at that time. I'd say they probably were because so like I said, a lot he, of the big stars they have right. sort of generic names. Because I'm thinking about you know the early '90s. You know, like the Pistons. I guess were big. I wonder if Detroit. Well, the Bulls. And, you yeah, know, Lakers, Celtics are always big. You know, something else we didn't mention either is in the opening. It's something else I love. This tension, just like we talked about last week with Lemmings and the stuff on the title screen. Attention to detail. When you start the game, uh, when you pick your teams, and the game starts, the home team stadium comes up, and the colors are all right because they've switched them over to whatever team you're playing as the mm-hmm. home team. You know, the cheerleaders have on the home team gear. You know, the, the color. You know, that seems sort of trivial. But I mean, it helps get you into the game, you know, because you're, you know, feel like you're at your home stadium, you know. It's, I always thought that was a neat aspect of it too, that they that they would go to, and also in the background at halftime, uh, or also at the beginning of the game when you're when you're seeing the uh, sports announcer, you can see the people in the background just over his shoulder on the court bouncing around and cheerleaders going around out there, you know, and, and people shooting baskets and stuff. I always thought that stuff was really 
just slick. Mm-hmm. You didn't have to do it, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. Um, so, you know, this week because it's a, a sports game, we can't really have a, a score competition. Although, like I said, you will destroy me you later will, on. You will, you will <laughs> see the score competition in mere moments when I put the boots to poor boat. But uh, you know, TV sports basketball, it's a two thumbs up. Yeah, big from, time from both of the amigos. Uh, check it out. Um, now let's move on to what we're going to talk about next week. So uh, next week, I thought maybe we could do a little bit of uh, one of your favorite titles for the Amiga. Uh, it's a game where you're a ninja, and it's a game that the title is escaping me right now. Wow, I love that one. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? What is that ninja game that you, we were talking there's, about? There's last a few week? thousand ninja games. No, this is the one that is like the big one. What's the big one? Zool? Zool, that's right. The Ninja Ant. Yeah, Zool the Ninja Ant. We'll do that next week. All right, that'll do it for this week. Make sure you tune into our YouTube channel to uh, watch our live stream. Watch your whooping. Yep. (laughs) So uh, we'll see you next week. Until next time, adios. adios. All right, welcome everybody to the uh, second Amigos podcast interview. Uh, Today we are interviewing Sean Courtney. Uh, Sean is a podcaster himself. Uh, he does the Pie Factory podcast, and we'll hear a little bit more about that later on. But for right now, I'd just like to say welcome, Sean. Well, thank you, John. It's a pleasure to uh, – I'm an honored to be part of this. Great. Um, well, let's dive right into it. Uh, what was your first exposure to the Amiga? Well, my first exposure to the Amiga, one of my friends back in high school was all about the Amiga. He was so sick of uh, – using MS-DOS machines, you know, he needed something to multitask, so he preached on and on and on and on about Amiga, and I actually got a chance to see it in action uh, when we were seniors in high school, homecoming week, there was one night, uh, one of the activities, uh, one, one, of the, one, of the, yeah, what am I trying to say, <laughs> um, one of the activity nights, he actually borrowed a, uh, a projection screen TV from the school and rigged up his Amiga and loaded up the Pinball Dreams demo and had oh. people give it a shot and i was like oh yeah oh yeah this is this is for me and now what year was this this was 1991 okay okay so yeah i'm sure coming from the uh the pc world you know the ega color palette and then seeing Uh, something like pinball dreams i'm sure it was like night and day oh yeah uh, that's that was awesome. coming from a Commodore 64, just <laughs> for the oh. comparison there. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a little bit of a... I mean, they, we're talking about, you know, the, the C64 was released in 80, 81, something like that? Somewhere around there, yeah. And so, you know, the Amiga only came about four years later, but, I mean, just talk about, you know, light years ahead in terms of, of graphical fidelity, uh, processing power, almost anything. So uh, it's... I, uh, I never... I'm a little bit younger than you, and so I I always came across these systems a little bit later. Uh, my first computer was an Atari 1200 XL um, that uh, my dad bought in uh, 1986 or 1987. Uh, but of course, at that time, it was already an old machine. So I've kind of been a retro gamer by default uh, sure, from the yeah. from the beginning. But uh, you know, I never had that moment uh, on computers of seeing that that thing. For me, it was always consoles. You know, moving from the NES to the Super Nintendo. So it's it's pretty special that uh, you know you were able to uh, to be part of it right. You know, at the height. You know, ninety one, ninety two was kind of the height of the Amiga's powers as far as uh, you know capturing market share. The games were coming out like crazy, and you didn't see that decline that you started to see in ninety three in the corner of ninety four. Yeah, so I learned when I actually got one in 93. Suddenly, <laughs> it's it, it's like I cursed the Amiga. As soon as I got one, my buddy was like, Amiga, and who the hell wants one of those anymore? Was like, <laughs> he was one of these guys who actually, like, like, once someone likes something he likes, he doesn't like it anymore. He loved Nirvana before anybody ever heard of it. As soon as Smells Like Teen Spirit came out, he's like, Nirvana, who? Right, For God's right. sake, even now, I just got my first software development job a couple of years ago. Then all of a sudden, he's like, you know what? I want to get out of software development. It's like, dude. <laughs> it's just know? not cool anymore. You know, it was yeah, great like, when nobody was into it. it it's not but... cool. <laughs> right. That's, I think that's the rule. <laughs> but yes, I got my Amiga. I got a, uh, my first Amiga was a, an Amiga 600 I got in 1993. And that's when suddenly stores decided they didn't want to carry Amiga stuff anymore. I had to mail order everything. Oh, now let's talk a little bit about that Amiga. It's the 600. What what made you purchase the 600 over the other models? 
Um, it's quite simply because it was the cheapest. Mm-hmm. Was and it released it, kind of, um, you know, was it kind of the successor to, you know, the 500, which was kind of the lower end Amiga of the, the original run? Is that kind of how the 600 was, was pitched? Yeah, I th- yeah, I think it was supposed to be kind of a newer uh, repackaging of the 500 plus. Because it oh, came with uh, okay. Kickstart 2.0 or 2.05, mine came with. And uh, um, I think what they were trying to do is put out just one more Amiga 500, but make it look more like one of the newer 1200 models yeah. or something. Yeah. Uh, how much did that that go for back then? Um, I personally paid 299 for it. 299.99. It was just bare bones. It was just the computer itself with a megabyte of RAM, uh, no hard drive. Uh, it came with a software package that included um, this little chintzy uh, word processor, uh, microtext, and this uh, program that I never, ever, ever used called Graphics Workshop. And I have no idea what that thing looks like. <laughs> I don't think anybody's even even heard of it. And it came with uh, RoboCop 3, um, Myth. And, and this is crazy. I don't know what game, what the third game was because... The outer packaging that the Amiga came in said it was Beast 3. The <laughs> label on the disc said it was Shadow of the Beast. When I loaded up the game, the title screen said Shadow of the Beast 3. So, I don't wow. know what I had. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at that price point at 299, they were probably marketing trying to market that at least in part with some of the contemporary consoles at the time, you know, the Genesis and the Super Nintendo. Did you yeah. get that feeling from the advertising? Um, I don't really, I, I don't really know. I, I wasn't quite sure because um, all I know is I wanted an Amiga, and that mm-hmm. one I could probably afford. I was in college, you know, I was only working part time, so you know, it's what my my money at the time would allow me to have. And um, I seem to remember on on all the BBSs. Remember those? Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, people were like, "What's okay? The twelve hundred looks nice. The four thousand looks really cool." But what's the 600 thing? Does Amiga really need another game machine? Mm. So that's I, I I didn't I didn't really know what to make of it. Whether it was a game machine, a computer, whatever. Mm-hmm. But um, another friend of mine actually recommended it to me. He's like, well, you know, a 600 would probably be best for you. Now, were you purchasing it for mostly as a game machine? I just wanted a, I just wanted a better computer. I didn't care whether it was games or what. Okay. I mean, I grew up with an Atari Twenty Six Hundred, and I still play those games to this day. So I guess I did want I did want it for games, but I also I was also um, a computer science student at the time. So you know, I needed something that was better than my Commodore Sixty Four. Oh, okay. Well, that makes sense. Um, did you run into um, you know as far as your comp size stuff? Uh, were there any you know what was was the Amiga kind of looked down upon, you know, by your professors when you were doing projects for class and stuff like that? I mean, as far as programming goes? Not really. I mean, they had heard of it. They just didn't know much of it. Mm-hmm. All they knew was that it ran on the Motorola 68000 series of processors, you know, because obviously it was all Windows where, where I was. And uh, yeah. if you were actually, now that I think about it, I did change, uh, I did change majors to journalism, and that's what my, my uh, bachelor's is actually in. And in our the journalism department at our school, all Amiga. Sure, right. If you weren't if you weren't running Max, you were running Amigas. I'm sure in ninety one, ninety two. Yeah, the, the one of the classrooms was full of Amiga five hundreds. Uh, I think the one of the professors in the journalism department had a three thousand in her office. Wow. The TV station had a two thousand with a toaster in it. That's in awesome. In fact, they even when I was a senior, they actually offered a uh, a single semester two credit course on how to use the video toaster i took that just so i could uh, get college credit for playing with an amiga yeah yeah i I was a music ed major and i would have taken that class why do you need that it's just cool why not you know um so uh you were talking about you know the software that the 600 came with did it come with any other accessories i mean i know that the the keyboard was built in right right yeah yeah the amiga 600 except for the monitor of course which i used a tv set at first Mm -hmm. uh that was it was an all-in-one really the floppy drive was built in I mean, it's basically like a, a, a much smaller 500, a much smaller, in a, basically a 1200 without the AG, AGA graphics and the uh, uh, numeric keypad. I see, I see. Um, you were talking about BBSs. How were you connecting to the BBSs with your uh, with your Amiga? Oh, yeah, well, with a modem, of course. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, I, and the crazy thing is I didn't have a hard drive for a few months, so I don't remember how exactly I managed to 
swap disks back and forth to get the terminal program loaded. But uh, I, I know there was a really good terminal program. Darned if I remember. I know that there were three Amiga BBSs in my town, and they were all running on CNET. That was the Amiga BBS software uh, of the day. Okay. So, um, yeah, I guess I just fired up a modem and dialed in, you know. Yeah, That was yeah. also how I first got exposed to the Internet, because one of the Amiga boards had a uh, had a uh, Internet and Usenet feed. So I've, I've been using the Internet since literally 1992, when I still had my Commodore 64. Yeah, you were quite the early adopter. Yeah. Um, I'm sure your friend hated that, that you were on the Internet before <laughs> he was. <laughs> um, so... Uh, what was the, I mean, you know, you talked about the, the uh, you know, in your college, what the Amiga, you know, the Amiga Lab and everything like that. But do you do you think that the Amiga, what was the Amiga scene like in the in the town where you were living, you know, with your friends? Did you have a lot of friends that had Amigas or? I had a, I had a decent handful. And I, I knew them all from uh, the BBSs, of course. But, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I and I was bumping into people, too. I was like, oh, yeah, I got an Amiga, too. Do you know of anybody anybody I can hook up with? I was like, yeah, follow me. You know? <laughs> so, so you I never really felt like you never really felt like you were on an island. You always there were people around. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. At least back when I first got the 600 for the first two or three years, at least. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, how about now? To what extent do you still use the Amiga? I don't. Right. I knew the answer to the question. <laughs> <asked it> anyway. <laughs> so, so what what happened? Well, what happened? I stayed in the Amiga scene for 13 years, from 1993 all the way to 2006. I had a 600. Um, I eventually got a 4000, which I later had rehoused in a tower. Um, and in 2003 or 2004, I don't remember, that's when the new Amiga 1 machines sure. came out, and I got the micro Amiga 1C, as they call it. It's a wow. tiny, so were, tiny motherboard. A six you were spending motherboard. the big bucks then, right? Those things weren't cheap. Yeah. Amiga Amiga is still not cheap. Are you that is me? very true. <laughs> and uh, I mean, there and I I went back to school. I was I went to the junior college taking some uh, computer courses just you know, to make myself a little bit more marketable, make better money and stuff. And so I'm taking programming classes. And I'm realizing I can't do any of this stuff on my Amiga. I need to get a PC or something. And you know, I just decided, you know what, I'm going to buy a used PC so I can actually do this. I got it used, so that way none of my money would go to Microsoft. Yeah. <laughs> to this day, not a single cent I've ever get, of my money has ever gone to Microsoft. That's right. But, keep, uh, keep fighting the good fight. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I think what you know. This is getting a little personal, but I think what really kind of did it for me was uh, in uh, in 2006, right when I left the Amiga scene, it was basically because you know. Uh, my wife and I were moving four states across the country, and she wasn't working at the time. She was taking some time off to finish her master's. Money was kind of tight. I was work. We're, I was working two jobs. She was working part time any side job she could get, and uh, they messed up her payroll once, and we wouldn't have had enough money to make rent. So I was like, mm-hmm. okay, that's enough. I'm putting this thing on eBay, and I got a ton of money for that amigo. Yeah. So I got a lot more than rent. <laughs> Yeah. So that was it. And when we got back on our feet, you know, I, I figured, you know what, I gotta get a I gotta get an Amiga one again. Problem was there was nothing available. Hmm. The, the the uh the Ami- Amiga one, the purpose of that was to run the new modern Amiga operating system OS four. Mm-hmm. And there weren't any boards being manufactured at the time that uh that came out. So I was like, Okay, I need to get something. So I got my first Mac and I haven't looked back. I love I love the Mac. I loved it from the first time I used it. And of course, right after I got my MacBook, what happened? Suddenly there were like three or four new Amiga One or not Amiga One, but OS four compatible boards being manufactured. I was like, you <laughs> Well, to tell you the truth, you know, from a productivity standpoint and from the use of a modern you know, any kind of modern software, I think you made the right choice going with the Mac as far as carrying you forward, but it would be cool to have one of those new boards for sure. Oh yeah! And in fact, even a friend of mine was saying, "Dude, get a Mac. It's just like the Amiga." You know, mm-hmm. he was yeah. he he runs an art gallery, and so he of course would know what's best for graphics and things. Yeah, absolutely. So. And uh, you know, I I was a Mac user for a long time. I had a couple stints working at uh, Apple retail doing training and stuff like that. So I, I love the Mac too. Um, and uh, I think that it really kind of became the logical extension from a lot of people. Uh, who were yeah. leaving the Amiga platform, you know, by choice or by, you know, uh, because they had to. Um, sure. Do you've got? Do you have a favorite game 
for the Amiga? Oh God, that's like asking what's your favorite Beatles song. Um, <laughs> yeah, let me. Uh, yeah, I, I had. To you think. can name more than one too. Yeah, um, I heard you guys mention the mention Edgar Vigdal. Mm-hmm. So his his two big games, Deluxe Pac Man and Deluxe. You ready for a bombshell? Galaga. Galaga is just the official. Found out is the official <laughs> pronunciation. All right. So it's the um, I, the emphasis is on the second syllable. Second Galaga. syllable. Galaga. Yep. Okay. <laughs> And, uh, it, and, of course, I wrote to you guys about Warblade, which is Deluxe Galaga, really. <laughs> um, I love those. I played the heck out of those. Um, uh, my brother, w- right around the time I had my Amiga 600, he was a uh, he, he got a Sega Genesis, and so I was digging a lot of the games on there, so I was looking for the same games on the Amiga. And turns out that they had one of my favorite, in fact, my all-time favorite Genesis game, Desert Strike. Oh, they so I, I played so many ex- hours of Desert Strike. That's a great game. I was game. so excited by that game. The only thing I didn't like was that the Genesis allowed you to select uh, levels of inertia on your helicopter, but the Amiga didn't. But, uh, uh, and I got really excited because one of the Amiga magazines, I don't remember if it was Amiga World or one of the other ones, reviewed Desert Strike, and they said, next up from Electronic Arts on the Amiga, NHL Hockey. And I was like, yes! <laughs> And it turns out that Desert Strike was Electronic Arts' last game for the Amiga. Oh, and that was I probably, was, I think that was, what, 92, Desert Strike, about around there? Yeah, that? yeah, they're about, they're 92. I mean, I, I think it came out on the Amiga right at the beginning of 94. Okay. And, uh, see, of course, I loved the uh, Pinball Dreams, Pinball Fantasies games. I tried Slam Tilt, but for some reason I could never get it working. I don't know. And that's that's the thing about Amiga that I... And I'm, listen- I'm listening to your podcast, and I'm re- reflecting back on my days. It's like, man, I love the Amiga, but in retrospect, it was a pain in the butt to use one of those things because you had to downgrade it to use certain programs, uh, or maybe your Kickstart ROM was like .0001 versions off or something. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But uh, yeah. I love those games. Um, Lemmings, of course. Mm-hmm. So, naturally, I loved your last episode hearing you talk about Lemmings. By the way, a little bit of trivia. I'm surprised I didn't hear mentioned. Um, I remember you and uh, you and Aaron were talking about uh, whether Worms came out la- came out second and or Lemmings came out second or whatever, and you correctly said Worms was after Lemmings. Mm-hmm. And what I love about I never I never had the pleasure to play Worms, unfortunately, but I know that there was a sequel to Worms called Oh Yes, More Worms. Really? Kind of take of, oh no, more Lemmings. I have never heard that before. That's very interesting. Yeah. Well, when we do our inevitable uh, Worms uh, podcast, actually, you know, did Worms come? Worms might have, Worms might have not made an appearance on the Amiga. Yeah, it actually did. Did it? Okay. Because I, I knew that it, it was probably real close to coming out at the same time that Amiga ceased <laughs> to be. So yeah, uh, it's one of the later titles. Um, but yeah, I, I love. I would have loved to have tried that. I just might have to track it down for something else, either emulate it or what. Um, well, I can course, tell you, you know, a great. There's a great version on Steam, and actually, I think I got it on like one of the humble bundle stores or something like that, uh, or sales. Uh, you get. Worms, uh, Worms Revolution is is a, is probably the best contemporary. If you want to play it on a modern system, I would I would recommend that version. Mm, I'll keep that in mind. Yeah, and uh, of course I'm you know I told you I grew up with an Atari twenty six hundred, never grew out of it. <laughs> mm-hmm. So you know I'm a, I'm an old school gamer from way back. So I would always look for games that were either complete emulations of what I played before or remakes or whatever. So, you know, I'd look for all the Pac-Man games, all the public domain ones, you know. Uh, I don't know if you remember Mega Ball, but... I, I never I never played Mega Ball. Really good breakout clone. Okay. T- tons of different Tetris games. I basically, I looked for all that stuff. You know, and we're going to be... someone actually did a Donkey Kong for Amiga that I think was basically a dead-on... I think they must have recompiled the arcade game for the Amiga, because it was. I was like, whoa... Huh. We're going to be doing a uh, a series. You know, we're going to start this uh, as soon as we finish up our pinball series. We're going to do. It's going to be called Attack of the Clones, and uh, we're going to be covering a lot of the, the the clones for the Amiga. You know, so this is great material for me to remember uh, for that episode. Um, do you have any other? Are there any other? You said Mega Ball. Uh, there's a Donkey Kong clone. Were there any other arcade clones that you remember playing for the Amiga? Oh, off the top of my head. Um... I can't really think of any more because I, I know that eventually my I got a, an Amiga powerful enough to run the MAME emulator, so I would just play arcade games on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, well, that's 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 definitely great information. How about non-game applications? Uh, you, yes. What were some of the ones you remember using a lot? <clears throat> All right. First and foremost, the best uh, classic Amiga program ever made, Directory Opus Magellan. Explain that to me. All right. You remember Directory Opus? No. Okay. Well, Directory Opus. This there was a, there was a an older program called Directory Opus, which w- it's you open it up, it gave you two windows side by side, and each window had a directory display, and there was a series of buttons right underneath that those two windows, where if you highlighted one, you highlight one file, you click copy, it copies to the directory on the right, or there's move button, you can highlight. So it's it's it was just the most amazing file utility. You could just highlight a file, click on a button, it'll do whatever it says, like delete the file. Or if it's a graphics file, you could click on View and it'll view it, and you could program your own buttons. Uh, when I had my Amiga One, my Micro Amiga One, I actually programmed a button that said Food Fight, and when you click it, it ran Atari an Atari seventy eight hundred emulator that played Food Fight. Wow! So, so this is like a uh, it's it's kind of like you know what Finder is now when you look at the different modes like Preview Mode and things like that, but it's way better know, than Finder. Okay. Okay. In fact, well, but- my whole thing, but that's the one thing I don't like about Mac is that I have not found a directory Opus equivalent. I actually tried programming one in Java once, but I kind of gave up on it because Java is a really bizarre language to develop in. <laughs> uh, but it's going back to what I was saying before, directory Opus Magellan. What they did was they took directory Opus and basically put it on crack if you will uh-huh. it would li- it, it was literally a workbench replacement like it would take over all the workbench features you double click anywhere on the uh, workbench desktop and you would suddenly get a window with buttons that appeared and oh you could wow you want. it was an amazing utility uh yeah look that thing up it was it was just an amazing and what the bad thing about directory opus magellan as a workbench replacement it did not work with the amiga one it doesn't work with amiga operating system four because it does what's called hardware banging, which means it has special code that directly addresses, like, the Paula chip, the Denise chip. And if it's not present on your system, it's not going to work. Mm. But uh, So, yeah, Directory Opus, Directory Opus Magellan are two of my favorites. Um, I'm an amateur musician myself, so I, did, so I used Octomed for MIDI sequencing. Um, later on, there was a program called Audio Evolution. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that one. But that came out probably in the late 90s, early 2000s. It was a, it's a multi-track recording program. It was a really good one. Um, I loved Yam for email. To this day, it's the best email program I've ever used. Um, iBrowse, of course, was my favorite web browser. And what I love about iBrowse is that because it's Amiga and it's way behind the rest of the web world, um, it doesn't know how to handle certain things. Like, um, eyebrows didn't know how to handle streaming real audio. So if there was, you remember real audio? Oh, yeah, it's, it's some of the worst times in my life is dealing with real <laughs> audio. <laughs> yeah, and there are people who would put up real audio streams because they didn't want people downloading. They're like, if yeah. you want to hear this, you're going to hear it live. Well, because Amiga browsers don't know how to handle it, it would freak out and say, couldn't open up this address location. And it would give you the actual URL that had the real audio stored, so I could actually download real audio, and wow. I still have a couple of those files. Well, that that worked out well for you. That's yeah, awesome. And, yeah, and it's and the cool thing about Amiga really is it's a hacker's dream, you know, it, especially in that regard, because Amiga doesn't know how to handle so many things. You can actually it can actually expose things that's that are they're not meant to be exposed. You can see what kind of you know interesting things you could do with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, I think a lot of people miss that that side of computing, you know, with modern operating systems that are so closed, you know, and so locked off and sandboxed and everything. Uh, that that freedom that you, if you wanted to, you know, tinker and open up the hood, you know, on platforms like the Amiga, they, they, that avenue was open to you. Oh yeah, good times. Well. Um, I wanted to leave a couple minutes for you to uh, kind of promote your your podcast, the oh, Pie Factory you. Podcast. So uh, tell tell our listeners uh, all about the Pie Factory Podcast, what you guys are doing over there. All right. Well, Pie Factory Podcast came about when uh, there it's Pie Factory Podcast. We talk about classic arcade video games. 
like we just finished up a, um, an episode where we're, we're talking about Atari's space duel and uh, Namco's Pac-Man. And what we do is at the end of every episode, we talk about a certain theme that we've identified with those two video games. Um, it was like one, one uh, episode we had, uh, we talked about, um, let's see, what, oh, what the heck did we talk about? Uh, like, like our first episode, we talked about Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong 3. And then at the end, we said, well, the theme here was uh, Donkey Kong games in which Donkey Kong was the enemy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As opposed to Donkey Kong Jr. And we also do obscure themes like Frogger and Asteroids, for, for instance. Like, those were games that I first played at Hunk's Pancake House in Bradley, Illinois. <laughs> ah, so it may not be immediately apparent to the listener uh, what the connection not, is. Sometimes it's not, sometimes it is. So that's what we do, and we have a lot of fun with that. Um, and uh, basically, we kind of approach these games we talk about from the eyes of a ho- of home gamers, which we are. You know, we, mm-hmm. we both grew up playing Atari games, and we both still do. Actually, Jim and I both do. So... Well, that's awesome. And now, are you an arcade machine collector yourself? No, 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 no. no I, have a, I, uh, small, I have a small apartment, and uh, I don't have room, and I really don't want to spend the money on it. I understand. I, I was just wondering, though, because, you know, Rob O'Hare was my last interviewee, yes. and uh, he's uh, you know he wrote a whole book about collecting arcade machines called Invading Spaces. Um, both Aaron and I are also arcade machine owners. Uh, I have a couple machines and a pinball machine, and Aaron's got a whole basement full of machines. So sure. I thought it was going to be a, a growing theme with, <laughs> with with our whole little Amiga circle that this would be a, an alternative thing. But it's cool that you're also into uh, into retro arcade uh, games, if not the machines themselves. Yeah, and th- I think what, another reason is because here in the Chicago area, we have a lot of places we can go to play these games, so we don't really even need to have them in our homes. That's very true. In fact, I will be going to Chicago uh, December 18th or 16th through 19th. Awesome. I'm going to be there for the uh, um, Midwest International Band and Orchestra Clinic, and I there plan on hitting up the, uh, I think it's called the Galloping Ghost. Is that yes, it? we just recorded there a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, so that, I'm, that's an awesome place. Um, Underground Retrocade, of course, it's my personal favorite place. Uh, other people prefer Galloping Ghost. I think they're both equally awesome. But, so uh, I'm going to be hitting up both of those places. For, uh, I, ho- I hope, at least. I'm not very familiar with Chicago, but I'm hoping that I can get from where I'm staying to there uh, without without too much trouble. Sure. Well, Sean, thanks very much for uh, for coming out and sharing your experiences with the Amiga. Um Everyone out there who's listening, if you would like to be interviewed for the Amigos podcast, uh, just shoot me an email at amigos at amigospodcast.com. And so I guess we'll my check cleared. Time. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks again for that, that large donation. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, it's been great. And, uh, Sean, if there's ever anything that uh, any game that you want us to review or anything like that, just uh, just let me know and we'll do it. Awesome. All right. We'll see you later, Sean. Thanks for having me.